it's interesting to me that the first question you ask me is about the women because i have an entire chapter you know relating to the women he encountered so i'll first talk about the women in sri lanka you know ibn batuta being a muslim traveler he actually did not talk much about women he was you you understand being a male muslim traveler at that time i suppose for their sensibilities and their culture uh, it was not seemly to write and talk about women in detail the only time he writes about sri lankan women and actually we have to thank ibn batuta for that fact because even in sri lanka people were not writing about women much was he said that everywhere he went the women of the country were adorned with jewels you know and they had necklaces they had bracelets they had anklets nose rings earrings all representing the the gems of the country so they would be it would be sapphires rubies tourmalines um peridots you know the semi precious stones and the precious stones we do not have diamonds and we do not have emeralds in this country he also says that the concubines of the king the singhala king uh, had a cap made out of pearls and you know sri lanka was very famous for pearls so i think that is also a way to recognize the concubines of the of the king that they had this caplet of pearls uh it i believe that because ibn batuta had a bit of a luxury eye his eye was drawn to it's not that he didn't see other women he saw plenty and so he commented on their adornment but his it went straight to the jewels it went straight to the luxury uh, items that they wore when when ibn batuta does talk about women he talks about them when he struck with wonder or amazement so he was quite amazed and horrified that the maldivian women went around topless and being a being a kadi and be one of the kadis appointed in the maldives he tried to get them to change he tried to get them to cover their their breasts and he then says he has a very amusing story that because he married four times and he had lots of slave girls he tried to force his slave girls to cover up and he said they seem so ungainly they seem so clumsy he's like please don't cover up now go back to how you were and uh so he was a practical man in in a sense but his depiction of women in the maldives gives me rise to believe that in sri lanka too the women went around topless but we were non-muslim women so maybe he didn't care so much about it so he did not care to comment or maybe by that time he had seen so many women who were topless he did not it did not seem uh, you know different to him he also talks about women traveling alone muslim women traveling alone and to me that was a real revelation because he talks about a woman who he met uh, crossing a river trying to ford a river somewhere in it could be the bosphorus and what happens was that the woman nearly gets swept away with her with a man servant and ibn batuta's party had to rescue her he does not say that like as if it is an unusual thing um he, he says he doesn't say oh that was very dangerous or foolish of us but he says I met a woman uh she was nearly carried away and we had to rescue her he says in past and he specifically says she was traveling alone he does talk about queens uh who are in power in the caucasus he talks about the respect that uh the, the turkish uh, that so you have to remember turkey at that time was not a muslim country it was uh byzantine so he was really struck by the respect the byzantine kings gave to their queens and treated them as equals he was puzzled by it because he did not come from a society that uh, treated women like that and he was struck by the what we may call the 
the liberal attitude that Southern African women had towards uh, sexual relations. And uh, they were Muslims, so he was even more shocked. But it was so entrenched in the country, and both men and women had additional partners other than their spouses that he could only remark on it. He could not do anything about it. So I think almost everything in my life has been an accident. It's like nothing planned. Uh, I'm of a certain age where we did not, when we grew up, writing was not a profession we thought of that you could have. I mean, we read books by writers, almost all Western authors. It was not something that I thought was possible because as a child, I had not read any any South Asian or non-Western authors because I suppose we were colonized and we were deeply influenced by that experience. And also because we speak English and so the books available were written by Western authors. I'm, I actually did a degree in sociology and when I was doing my thesis, I came across, because I'm a qualitative sociologist rather than quantitative. So uh, I don't deal much with statistics. It's more with like the stories and what we, what are the situations that need to be addressed. When I was doing my thesis, my bachelor's thesis first, um, I was really struck by all the stories. These it, I was in Los Angeles. Uh, writing my thesis and I had to interview immigrant South Asian women and how they had adjusted to life in America, in Los Angeles. I was struck by all the other stories that they were telling me that I couldn't actually include in my thesis. And I will say thus began my writing life. But that was writing in private. And when I showed some, I, I used to work, I used to come back to Sri Lanka every summer and I worked as a sociologist in an NGO. I happened to show the editor of the journal and he said, you know, these are really good and we would like to publish them. So that was my first foray, it was kind of accidental that they thought that the stories had a sociological bent to it and could teach people things about or, or make them reflect on certain situations. And so that's how I began actually. I never thought, so no one can be a full-time writer in our part of the world. Very, very, I would say 0.0 percentage, like 0.01 maybe. So you have to always have another job uh, uh, that pays you a living wage. So I was always doing other regular work. And it's only when I began publishing house because I co-founded a publishing house with my husband that but even then I don't get a chance to write so much because I'm working on other people's work and you know running a publishing house is like a, like running any business so writing was quite accidental but now it's part and parcel of my life I can't think of not writing and I'm always I'm a curious person so I'm always interested in what's happening around me if you, that's such a difficult question because actually, as you say, it is the perfect storm that you want. And uh, I mean, but I think maybe for me personally, and I speak personally, it is the ability to be able to work on your craft. And to have that ability to work on your craft, you need to have a good grasp of language. In that you can write fiction just looking out of your window. We are lucky. We are in that part of the world, right? Pakistan, Sri Lanka, India, all of Southeast Asia. We maybe even in parts of Africa, we can look out of our window and we see a story happen. And maybe you need healthy dollops of imagination as well. But I get enough of manuscripts on my desk with a story. I can see the germ of the story, but it is told so badly that you can't read the story. And those are the manuscripts that get rejected. 
the manuscript and uh, so I do think firstly why would you write if you cannot write well and I I think uh, today with Twitter and Instagram and Facebook where people are and WhatsApp where people are used to writing these short bursts of messages it takes dedication and commitment to sit down and just slog out page after page after page and to follow the thread, not get distracted, uh, to sit down and cull characters that you have created with love and then realize they have nothing to do with the story. So writing fiction and you know the thing is now Ibn Battuta was my first non-fiction book that's a totally different way of writing and but one of the things about non-fiction is you always have a backup of facts you can always go back and check you know what was the historical period like what did the people wear what did other people say about it whereas with writing fiction you sit in front of a blank screen and you have a germ of a story and you just start writing and 10 to 1 that first page that you've written when you look back at it after you've written 75 pages you're going to cut because that is the page that came out when you were kind of you had this you had a germ of a story but you were waffling and trying to find a way around it and then you get into the story so it's both i cannot choose so I would say the reason you write is because you have this story that needs to be told. The reason you are read is because you are able to tell the story so easily and so effectively that people are interested in reading it. And that boils down a lot to language and to craft. When that president, Kodabe Rajapaksa, was elected. It was very disheartening for us, especially because I belong to a minority community as well, right? And he came on a purely racist platform. And at that time, it was it was really for someone to live all their life in Sri Lanka, that, you know, in this country and to have come back to, to, you know, I studied abroad, I lived abroad, I worked abroad, and then I made a conscious decision to come back in 2003 when the war was still going on. So that means we were fighting a civil war in the north, but there was still enough of a, of a pull to this country that I would leave and come back to, come back here to start a business and to to make my life here because there's only one thing that will make people do such a thing and that thing is called hope and then uh, when Gotabe Rajapaksa was elected it honestly made me think about about this country I lived in about what people wanted and the place of minorities in this country but you know it was a done deal and he got on board and he started work and clearly like I, I tell all the people who voted for him they I, I mean one thing that the Aragalaya did so the Aragalaya is a single word for struggle and I think it was a beautiful movement it is a movement I have lived I have waited for a long time to see because during the civil war I used to work in an NGO, a think tank, and it was an NGO that worked on work for human rights. And I used to be one of the few people who also protested, but we were protesting for the human rights record of this country to be better, for actually there to be no human rights violations. That's impossible in a country of today, in any country. But um, I mean, here were we killing our brothers and sisters in the north. We were treating them as if they were like, an, they belong to an alien community and came from somewhere else. And I know that many times uh, 
people would regard us a few of us who worked in human rights as traitors and it was and uh, so you, you are still, but i lived in this bubble this little ngo bubble my world was them i worked with them i socialized with them and i didn't have much exposure you could say i steered clear from people you know who would uh, who thought the war was right who thought that um, you know the minority should bow their head and and just live under the majority and that we should be grateful for that kind of position then the war ended it didn't end in in a way that i would have liked to see it ended very violently there was no negotiation at all but fine it ended there was a chance for us to make our country but again we did not because it, again i believe governments reflect people because it's the people who elected them and so when in 2019 when the presidential election happened and we have a president coming in on a racist platform it was very very disheartening so when i saw the struggle happen which was actually this immense movement it's a struggle that we also took part in and we would i would my husband and i and our friends we would leave our homes in the morning carrying flags and we would just walk down to this big esplanade golf course and uh, you didn't have to do anything virtually but be present be present to express your outrage so when you say violent scenes that was just those were just you know it happened on maybe two or three days the struggle went on for months during the during the many months there were art exhibitions there was theater there were uh, performances there were speeches there was just a gathering of of people who wanted to save their country now so then that movement came to its natural end we had a change. the president had to run away from the country a new president had to be sworn in and i feel that the mistake that we all made was we wanted the president out but we didn't say who we wanted in we wanted system change but we didn't say how the system change should be we knew what we didn't want but i suppose you also have to think about what how the line should be drawn on what you want and now we have another situation and also we have food security is uh, a big question for a lot of low income people but there's a semblance of there's a semblance of life adjusting to the new normal it's not ideal but people are carrying on i hear there are rumblings of another movement for change which i think is good but i hope we all all as a people get together and think how we want to change and what exactly the change should be so life has quietened down a lot um we you know our fuel is is uh, limited we are on a quota and the quota works well most of the time i would say the quota works well most of the time sometimes when you do a long trip you run out of your quota then you just have to wait uh where you are you know until the next week comes and you can fill up there's a lot of adjustment i it's interesting for me as an almost a bystander to see now how everything is playing out how what the government is going to do we are having local government elections supposedly next month i don't know if it will happen uh people are very unhappy with the government that is in existence now so the government is not a stable government it's it's in fact very unstable but i think people just now are grateful that they can put some food on the table they have some fuel in their vehicles and they can go to work and come home and earn a bit of money things have tripled in prices 
it's unbelievable how expensive things are. I fear when I go to the supermarket. I truly fear because when I see my grocery bill at the end of it, they're all staples. It's three times what I would have paid like 18 months ago. So life is very difficult. But I like to think that Sri Lankans are a very practical thing. I think that we work a lot with what we have, even if the what we have is not much. And I would consider myself one of the super lucky people, you know, because I still can afford a lot of things. There are a lot of people who can't afford a lot of things for cutting down, whose children find it difficult, perhaps to travel to school because bus prices have gone up. Um, and I hear there are lots and lots of people who don't have enough to eat. But I'll tell you this, I started a home garden, my little patch in Colombo, about 15 years ago. And it's because I just wanted to eat uh, food that was grown in a more healthy way. And I feel that uh, I also grew up in the 1970s where we had not a similar kind of government, but we were com our lives were completely rationed to get to buy material. So sew your clothes was rationed, food was rationed, rice was rationed, sugar was rationed. We grew up standing in queues as children we had our own Russian book and uh, so things are not like that. Things are not like the 1970s. And once a younger person in their 20s came and told me, you're lucky because you will adjust better than we do because you know what life was like with, dep with some deprivation. And it is true, actually. Both my husband and I belong to that era. My parents lived through wartime and uh, during socialism. So my household has cut down a lot, but it was not, it was an easier transition for us because we knew what it was to live like this before. I believe people in the North and the East, they also have transitioned to managing better because they also live in through 30 years of deprivation. They didn't have electricity for 30 years. They didn't have they didn't have batteries, they didn't have fuel at all. So actually, for 30 years, they are like far, far worse than what we are going through now. And I always remind myself of that.